All right, this morning, this morning we're continuing on in our study of the book of Matthew. But before we get into the text um, for this morning, would you mind turning with me to the book of Malachi? So if you're already at Matthew, all you got to do is flip back a few pages in the book of Malachi. Book of Malachi, we're looking at chapter 4. And I'm going to read for us verses 4 to 6. Follow along in your Bibles if you're there. Malachi chapter 4, verses 4 to 6. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Those are the last three verses of the Old Testament. And those were the last prophecies that were spoken in those days for 400 years. So imagine that. The last thing that God speaks to the children of Israel is he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers. And he ends with, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. And then for the next 400 years, no prophets. No prophecies. God does not speak. Imagine, imagine that, okay? God doesn't want to strike them with a curse. Though he's saying, I, I, I'm sending someone to turn everyone around, to turn everyone back to how they were supposed to be, because I don't want to come and strike the earth with a curse. And he says, he says he will send the prophet Elijah. So that ends the last prophecy in the Old Testament times. And now we come to the New Testament. And so turn with me, Matthew chapter 3, turn with me there, and we'll read a few verses there. John, uh, Matthew chapter 3, we'll start with verse 1. In those days, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Okay. Now, question I guess would be logical to ask is why am I connecting the last words of God through Malachi with today's passage all right what does it have to do with John the Baptist let me read to you from the book of Luke you don't have to turn there the book of Luke chapter 1 verses 15 to 17 this is the angel when he speaks to Zacharias telling him that he is going to have a son John this is what the angel says for he, the son, he will be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people for the Lord. God, in his prophecy, in saying that he was going to send Elijah, was not going to send Elijah physically. Elijah is dead, right? God was not going to bring Elijah out of the tomb and send him again. But what God was saying, we see in the book of Luke, the angel says, John the Baptist would come, and he would come in the spirit and in the power of Elijah, right? So the last verses in the Old Testament are pointing forward to a new prophet to come, and he is speaking of John the Baptist. And so now we have the context, right? The last time God spoke, he promised he would send Elijah to turn the Israelites back. And the angel, in announcing John's birth, helps us connect the dots. This is a prophet of whom God spoke. And so John the Baptist is a pretty big deal, right? God, in the last words he spoke 400 years ago, says, I'm going to send someone. And then 400 years of silence, and then here comes John the Baptist. Right? He's the first prophet to speak in 400 years. Okay, so let's go back to the book of Matthew. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, for this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John himself, verse 4, Now John himself was clothed in camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the region around the Jordan 
went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. Okay. So where was John preaching? Right. This is the first prophet to, to come to the people of Israel in 400 years. Where was he preaching? He's not preaching in the synagogues. He's not preaching in the town squares. He's preaching out in the wilderness, showing us that he is isolated from the world. He has nothing to do with the world. He doesn't want to be in contact with the world, right? So he's wearing camel's hair and a leather belt, and he ate locusts and love honey, right? He's not wearing anything made by man, and he's not eating anything made by man. He's making a statement, I have disassociated myself from the world. Okay? Now, he set himself apart, and what did Isaiah say about John? Isaiah prophesied about John saying that he would be the voice of one crying in the wilderness. And we see he is in the wilderness. He's set apart from the rest of society and he's just a voice, right? The prophet Isaiah says that John is a voice. What is significant about Isaiah saying that John is a voice, right? You can't follow a voice. Right? There is not something physical in the voice. You can't follow a voice. You can't worship a voice. You can't glorify a voice. The function of a voice is that it brings a message to the ears and hopefully to the hearts of the hearer. And after that message is spoken, where's the voice? The voice is gone. Right? And so this is the point that Isaiah is making. John is coming, but he's not significant. Well, he is significant, but he is not in that. He is significant in that he's the first prophet in 400 years. But the point about John is he comes, he brings a message, and he disappears. And we see, we will see later, John says, less of me and more of him who is to come. I am going to go away so that you, all the people who have been listening to me, can focus your attention on the one who is to come. And that is Jesus, right? And so this is the function of John, and he's not just speaking softly. Right? He's crying in the wilderness. There, there is a passion. He, he is bringing a, a, it's not a subtle message that he brings. Right? And so he says, he comes and he says, Isaiah prophesies, he's going to come and say, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. This is John's purpose. He's going to prepare the way of the Lord to make the path straight. In those days, right? in those days when a king is coming, when a king from another place is coming to you, especially, especially a king that has conquered your land, and now he's coming to see, he would send a herald forward ahead of him who would announce his arrival. And what the herald does is he goes through the countries and the places where the king would travel, and he announces the king's coming, and he commands, the herald commands, make the path straight, literally, right? So the king's going through the wilderness. If there's valleys, fill up those valleys. If there are hills, take out those hills. If the path is crooked, make it straight because you are going to make it easy for the king to come, right? This was the purpose of the herald. He goes out and he makes sure that the way is straight. I don't know if you've ever been, um, if you've ever encountered a presidential motorcade. Uh, I think once many years ago, Alice ran into one in, in, in LA. I think it was President Clinton at the time and his motorcade was going down the 405 freeway. What they do is, for several miles ahead of the motorcade, they clear traffic. Nobody is allowed to be on the freeway. But the more amazing thing is, on the opposing side of the freeway, they go backwards, getting people off the freeway, so that there is, a, I think, a two-mile buffer in front and behind the motorcade on both sides of the freeway that travels with the motorcade, right? Getting people off the freeway ahead of you is easy. Getting people Clearing that buffer on the other side, that's hard, but they make it happen so that the president would have safety all around him, right? Make his path straight, prepare the way. This is what the herald did, right? He would go ahead and he would clear the way and make it easy for the king to come. Now, this is the literal work of the herald. What does it mean spiritually for John to come and announce a king? He's coming and he says, spiritually speaking, Right? When, the, when the valleys are filled, those who are spiritually low are lifted up. When those hills are taken away, spiritually speaking, those who have pride that need to be dealt with, they are brought down low so that everyone is made right before God. And it's easy to think, right? What does it mean for the crooked way to be made straight? Well, if you're crooked in your heart, your way is going to be made straight. Prepare the way for the Lord. 
world, right? And so this is John's job. He, he's come to announce the king, and he's saying, the king is coming. The king is coming. Get ready for him, right? Now, here is John's message. He says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is a hand. Okay? The kingdom of heaven is a hand. God's about to come. God is coming, and when God comes, there will be a reckoning. God is going to sit down with you, okay? Taxes are coming. It's, it's due April 15th, 15th, right? When you do your taxes, there is an accounting of how much you made and how much you owe to the government. There are numbers involved. Guess what? When God comes, there is also an accounting, a reckoning. You are going to sit down and there is going to be a ledger that we go through. Right? God's going to look at every moment of your life, everything you've done, every thought you've had. There is a reckoning coming. God is coming. And so John says, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent. Make things right. You know, in, in, back in uh, the book of Malachi, we saw uh, that the prophet will be sent before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the father to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers. Repent. John is saying, repent because judgment is coming. Repent and turn away from your sins, right? What does it mean that, that the hearts of the fathers will be turned to the children and the children to the father? The patriarchs of the Israelites, right? The fathers who came before, they revered God. By this point in the time of Malachi, Israel was a mess. And so the children, many generations later, had nothing to do with the fathers anymore. They didn't love God, they didn't respect God. And the fathers, if they were around, would be ashamed of these children. What has become of you? And Elijah, the prophet Elijah to be said, who we see as John the Baptist, his job is to come and turn the two back to each other again. Make the children right, right? Restore them to God. And so here is John and his, his message, his message of repentance. He comes baptizing, right? And he says, be baptized. And his baptism is a baptism of repentance. It is a baptism wherein people come and confess their sins. But a message of repentance, right? When we speak of repentance, we must also speak about sin. Because if, if look, if no one is confessing their sins, then what is there to repent from, right? Repenting means turning away from sin, turning away from the wrong that you're doing, turning away from being away from God, because the, our, our very nature, the way we are, we are facing away from God and we are walking away from God, running even, right? Repentance means no longer heading towards sin and turning 180 degrees around, not 360. You don't want to turn 360 because you'll be going right back where you're going. You turn 180 degrees, come back to God and turn away from your sinful ways. That is the message of repentance. Right? And so these people who were coming out to the wilderness to see John the Baptist preach, they came, it says, they came confessing their sins. If people came confessing their sins, but not really confessing their sins, right? I don't know if you've ever done this, right? When we pray, we ought to confess our sins. And many times, we don't want to talk about what we've done wrong. And so we pray, say, Lord, forgive me for my sins, just all of them. And I don't want to think about the specifics, but you know I sin and you know what, right? Sometimes when we confess our sins, it's just an obligatory confession. We're doing it because we have to, but we don't really look down deep in our heart at what is in our heart. And, and John, he comes and he preaches, he says, repent. And we know, we know that there is power in John's message, right? Not, it's, well, John came in the spirit and power of Elijah, but also he's, his words carried conviction because he was a messenger sent from God. And so what you see is people were coming and coming and coming, right? The Bible tells us that all Jerusalem, Judea, all the regions around the Jordan, right? Masses of people were coming out to him. Now think about this. He's preaching a message of repentance. So there is talk of sin and yet people wanted to come. Right, so there must have been power in his preaching, in his word, that would bring people out to him and make people want to come and confess. Because we don't like to think or talk about our sins. Right, it's, it's, not, it's not a fun message to hear, to, to have someone saying, you are a sinner. Right, who, who wants it? Everybody wants to hear a good message. God loves you, and he's got a plan for you, and he has blessings in store for you, and if you do this, and you will be blessed, and if you do that, you will be rich beyond, right? 
lot of people like to hear these messages. Churches that preach these messages, they got a lot of people. Because right? they want to hear something good. But the message to be preached has to start with the very foundation, and that is we are sinners. We are sinners. John preached this message. It was not a popular message. But people were flocking out to hear him and to confess their sins. Right? And this was a power. This was a power evident in John's preaching. But we see, we see as he preached that there were some unexpected visitors coming out to see him. Verse 7. Verse 7, but when he saw, when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Brood of vipers. And you might say, crikey, man, what, a, what a greeting this is. You know, imagine, imagine today, imagine today if Alice is standing outside, Greeting all the pastors by who, who walk by and they ask, Oh, what is this? Is this his church? And he says, Yes, you brood of vipers. Come on in and worship with us, you brood of vipers. Right? John doesn't mince his words. Right? And you look at this. These were the Pharisees and Sadducees. Right? The Pharisees, you know, the Pharisees, they really have a bad rap in the Bible. Right? Because at this time, we see that their hearts are really hardened. They were all about obeying the law because they believed that they were able to obey the law completely. And they believed that by obeying the law, they were able to obtain their salvation. Do you know how the Pharisees started? They started as a group that held staunchly to God's command that you should not marry outside of the Israelites. Right? God said, I want my people to stay pure. Do not marry outside of your faith and of your ethnicity. And so there was a group of people who said, okay, we are going to obey this. And so the name Pharisee literally means separated. They said, we will not do what the other Israelites are doing. And they held to God's law. But eventually, over time, the group of Pharisees became a very elitist and exclusive group that looked down on others. And they believed wrongly that they were able to obey all the laws and thereby obtain their salvation. Sadducees. Sadducees. You know why they were called Sadducees? Because they didn't believe in the resurrection. And if you don't believe in the resurrection, then it's got to be very sad, you see. I'm sorry, that was, that was an old one from elementary. So. so the Sadducees, they don't believe in the resurrection. Okay? And you have the Pharisees who don't believe in a need for anything outside the law. These two groups, just think, it would be so hard for them to hear this message of repentance. Because what does it mean, right? And they don't believe in the power of the resurrection. And so these two groups, they would have the hardest time in accepting the gospel. Alice, don't call them brutal vipers, okay? Be nice. Okay. These two groups will have the hardest time accepting the, uh, the gospel that John is preaching, right? Brood of vipers. But you know what? Here's the thing. We are all brood of vipers. We are all that brood of vipers. What is a brood? It's a group. It's, it's a cluster. Just think, a bunch of snakes living around together. That's what John called the Pharisees and Sadducees. But this is not limited to just the Pharisees and Sadducees. This is all of us, right? The, when John calls them this, he speaks to the condition of each and every one of us in our fallen nature, having eaten the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, the life of the serpent, the devil himself. That life has now come into our own and mixed with our life. Each and every one of us has been tainted. You know, I, I've given this example before, right? If, if you take a bottle of water, if today I pass out to each of you a bottle of water, which is really bad for the environment because we've got plastic bottles. But anyways, bottle of water, and, and you know that every bottle is sealed, right? So you, you trust that this bottle is clean. If I told you, if I told you that before I gave you the bottle, I opened it, and I put just the tiniest, tiniest, not even a drop of water, just barely touched it with a little bit of sewage water. Would you drink that water? I don't think you would, because that's no longer clean, right? This water is no longer clean. It's tainted even just a tiniest little bit. And that's our life. It doesn't matter to what degree you have been tainted with the devil's life in you. It's tainted. Our lives are dirty. And so we are all that brood of vipers. Right. Now, I hope you don't carry that name with a badge, like a badge of honor, right? But we're all brood of vipers. We are all in this life. And it's, it's, look, it's not something that I enjoy or relish saying. 
And you might get that idea because I say it so much. Right? I, I don't enjoy saying it, but it is a reality we have to face. You know, again, if a doctor, if you go to see a doctor, and every time you see the doctor, the doctor ignores whatever is wrong with you and says, you're fine, Mr. Sue, no problems, you're in great health, and they ignore any warning signs, you don't go to that doctor anymore, right? We need to tell the truth of what the human condition is. Now, it's not a pleasant message to preach, right, having to tell someone that you're a snake. And it would be easier if I wasn't one myself, but I am also part of the brood of vipers. Right? And that, that's the unfortunate thing that we deal with. Now let's see what John says. He goes on in verse 8. He says, Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance, and do not think to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. God wants to restore the latter generation of the Israelites to how the patriarchs were. And the Pharisees and Sadducees, they came to resist this message that John was preaching. What was their grounds for resisting? They thought, they thought, the Israelites thought because they were Abraham's children, right? Because we are descendants of Abraham, because we are Abraham's children, then we can get away with how we live because Abraham's children are saved, right? We are God's people, we're the chosen ones. Well, we, you can't do anything to us, right? We, we are safe, and so this is where they were. They were not in a good place spiritually, and John's message to them at this time when he called them brood of vipers, what is, he, what is he saying, what does he mean? Don't say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. What John is saying is your lineage, your background, your history, your traditions, none of that will save you from the wrath to come. So don't depend on it, right? Don't just hail back to my father Abraham and say, because I am a child of Abraham, then I, I am exempt from judgment. There is wrath to come. And John is saying, turn back. Turn your hardened hearts back. Don't rest in the thought that you are saved simply because you are a descendant of Abraham, right? And if you won't turn, John says, if you won't turn, if you won't repent, if you won't heed my message that the kingdom of heaven is coming and that you need to repent, if you won't repent, then so be it. God will raise children out of these stones to Abraham, right? What a blessed message that is, because guess what? That's us. Because of the hardness of the hearts of the children of Israel, a door was opened and we were brought into the picture of salvation, right? This is us, the children that were brought up from the stones. That's us, the Gentiles, right? And so, so let's say, let's say that this morning you recognize that need to repent, right? How do we deal with this fallen life of ours? Verse 10, and even now, John says, even now the ax is laid to the root of the trees Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Okay? John does not mince his words here. He, actually, he almost never minces his words. He, he just says it like it is. You know, a lot of times we go down this road of, okay, Jesus, I, I understand and, and I know that I am a sinner and my life is sinful and I know that there's nothing good that comes out of me. So, Jesus, please forgive my temper. Please forgive that how I'm prone to laziness and, and forgive me because I, I'll lie once in a while. And so Lord, forgive me those things. But, and this, we, we continue in our prayer and we say, but Lord, you know, you gotta admit, right? I've been playing guitar for a good many years, so maybe there is something good in my life that you can use. There's a little bit of me that is good, right? And, and so you can use that, right? Lord, I'm a pretty bad sinner, but I'm not all bad, am I, Lord? And we, we come into this little, um, repartee with God to, to kind of sculpt out parts of our life that we can be happy with, that we can maybe be a little bit proud of, and we can say, Lord, at least there is some good in me, right? You know what, what does John say? Even now the ax is laid at the root of the trees, right? He doesn't say the ax is on the parts of the tree that do not bear good fruit, but is saving the other parts that bear good fruit. The ax is laid at the root of the trees, and so the tree, right, that's us, the sinner, 
all of us, starting at the root, must be dealt with. Because there really isn't an ounce of good in us. You know, and so speaking of, of playing guitar, I actually have been serving musically in church for many years, starting in middle school um, and all the way through high school and college. And, and I did a lot at church. I served a lot. I served faithfully. And this is part of my testimony. In, in high school, when everybody was busy studying for the SATs, right, we, we saw the worship team drop like flies whenever the SATs came around because people stopped coming to worship practice because it took time out of the week, right? But I was always faithful. I was always there every single week. I never skipped practice. And I, I, this was my testimony before. Because of my faithfulness to God, He was faithful to me, and I did pretty decently on the test. Right? I gave up something, and He rewarded that. At least that was my thought. So I thought, I'm doing something good. I've got something good going on here. Right? It, it was a point of pride for me, my service in the church. And until so one day, God dealt with that pride. In my early 20s, God spoke very clearly about my service with my instruments. You know what he said? I don't want any of that. I don't want any of that. And I, I remember I broke hard and I was weeping. I said, but, but Lord, this, this is how I love you. This is how I serve you. And God said, I don't want any of it. This is distasteful to me. It is not an aroma. It is not a fragrance. This, what you give me here, this is distasteful to me, and I don't want any of it. And so there, there was a period of time. There was a period of time in my life where I was not serving musically in church, and I sold off a lot of my instruments, um, partly to make room for my wife and her clothes in my closets. But I, I basically just became not involved in church musically. Because God was taking that time to whittle away that pride that was in my heart. He says, look, the, the, the music is fine, but the, ori the, the, the origin of it is from your fallen flesh. And if that's what you're bringing, I don't want it. And so he spent that time, God spent that time to take that pride away. Shaving it off little at a time. Little at a time. Until a day came when the Lord said, now you're ready. Now you're ready, and, and then I gotta go buy guitars again because I need a lot of guitars. So I was ready again to serve. And I can tell you there's a difference. Now, when I come and I serve, when I bring what I have, there's a heart of reverence. There's an understanding that I am not worthy to do this. There is not the thought of, God, you got it pretty good. You know, I'm, I'm bringing something that I developed. I, did, did you see, God, what I'm bringing, the skills that I have? There is not that thought anymore. And sometimes when it creeps in, I deal with it because I understand that that's not what God wants. The point is, nothing good comes from us. We have to, we have to see and understand that, right? We can't go to God and say, well, I have a little bit of good still, you know, maybe you can take that. God needs to deal with every corner, every aspect of our life, right? And so I, I had to come and understand through that period of time, as God spoke to me, that I am a viper through and through. And it was only after God dealt with my flesh that he called me to serve him again. Okay? Now let's go on, go on with what John is saying. Verse 11, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. He is, his winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. You know, as we mentioned earlier, John's baptism is a baptism of repentance. Right? You come, confess your sins, and you repent. You turn away from your sins, and you are baptized and cleansed of your sins. But Jesus' baptism... Right? Jesus' baptism is not a baptism of repentance. Jesus' baptism is a baptism of judgment. And what do I mean by judgment? The word judgment literally means a separation. It is a sorting. Right? When something comes, you sort it. It is either this kind or that kind. That is what judgment is. Right? God, everybody comes for God, and God judges and says, you will be this or you will be that. You will either be the sheep or the goats. You are either saved or you are not saved. That is the baptism of Jesus. If you are baptized 
by the Spirit into the body of God, you are saved. Jesus comes baptizing with the Spirit and with fire. If you are baptized by the Spirit into God's kingdom, you are saved. If you choose not to be baptized by the Spirit into the family of God, then you gotta get ready for a baptism by fire. All right, that's what we're speaking about here. This baptism by fire is being thrown into the unquenchable fire for eternity. Right? That forever judgment, once you are judged at the end of days, that you are not saved, that's it. And that is that baptism that you have chosen for yourself. Now all of us here being saved, we have chosen to be baptized in the Spirit. And that's good news for us. Right? But when we go out, when we see people who are not saved, our thought must be, it, it's an urgency, what is coming from people who are not saved. And that's, that's what prompts us to preach the gospel. It's not about filling up the empty seats in the church, and we have some. It's not about that. It's not about having more of the more the merrier. It's not about having points on your heavenly debit roster, whatever, right? It is that you see a person and you see that their soul is not saved and you know what is coming and you, you have an urgency. I want you to be saved. Right, and that, that's why we preach the gospel, but for us, for us, this message that John preaches of his baptism and the baptism to come from Jesus. Look, this morning, this morning, if you walk away thinking that I'm preaching about fire and brimstone, then you've missed the point. Now, John's message is a warning. It is, it is a warning. But a warning is not a warning if there is not a hope. If there's not something to be offered, right? Otherwise, it is not a, a message of warning. It is just condemnation. A warning means you're being told something is coming, but there's something that can be done about it, right? And this morning, in this warning, there's a hope. John is paving the way for one who is greater than he. And that's the message of hope. That's the message of salvation. Jesus is coming, John says, right? He is the voice. He's coming to announce who Jesus is and that Jesus is coming and that he's going to go away. After John's gone, Jesus is coming. And we know, we know that Jesus comes offering salvation by putting his body in the place of ours to receive the wrath of God, to receive God's judgment. Right? And so there is a message of hope. And so this message is get ready. Jesus is coming. Right? In Jesus, in Jesus, even a brood of vipers like us have hope for redemption. And like I was saying last week, I, this morning, I can stand in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and I can know that he loves me, a sinner condemned unclean. That is our message of hope. Recognizing that we are vipers, but knowing that Jesus comes and he sees me, and he sees something precious in me, and he loves me, and he is willing to die for me. Right? And so this, this morning, I, I hope that we walk away with this message of hope, seeing that there is a warning, but also seeing that, yes, there is a way out, there is a salvation. And that salvation is offered to us all. And this is our work now, to go out and tell everybody else about the salvation, to let everyone else know about this good news. Let's bow our heads and pray. I thank you, Jesus, that you love us, that you see us, Lord, indeed a brood of vipers, and there is nothing good in us, but you see something beautiful, Lord, and you see something precious and worth saving. And I thank you, for John the Baptist, who was sent before you to announce your way. And I thank you, Lord, that you have come to bring us salvation. And I pray this morning that you will send each of us out, Lord. We are not John the Baptist, but Lord, use us as your herald to bring the message of your salvation to all the world around us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.